Chapter 3 The Heart's Burden Shoe Fly was alone in the big kitchen. She heard a timid knock and went to the door. There was Betty Ferguson. Nobody had invited her. I came for a visit, said Betty. Betty was dressed in t-shirt and blue jeans. Her head was a bird's nest of curls. Shoefly opened the door and Betty came in. They stood and looked at each other. What would ma'am say? <clears throat> Shoefly went back to her work. She was making shoefly pies, four of them today. Beck had lighted the gas oven and helped her mix the pastry. Now they were ready to put in. What are you doing? asked Betty. Baking pies, said Shoe Fly, to sell at the pie stand on the highway. A row of pies, already baked, stood on the counter. What's this? Betty pointed to bread pans sitting on the back of the range. They were filled with dough set to rise. The dough was white and soft and puffy. It was rising up over the tops. That's bread, said Shoe Fly. Ma'am's baking bread to sell, too. Do you sell pies and bread? asked Betty. Yes, good homemade bread, said Shoe Fly. I got to go to the pie stand tomorrow. As she told Betty about it, it made her feel very important. It looks good, said Betty, so soft and puffy. She reached out and pushed her forefinger down in the middle of each puffy loaf before Shoe Fly could stop her. The puffs began to sink slowly, and the dough went soggy. Ock, cried Shoefly, look now what you've done. You've ruined ma'am's bread. You're not to touch it. When it goes once down, it won't come up again. It stays flat and has to be fed to the hogs. Betty said, oh, does it? She tossed her head. How should I know? Bib came in first, then Beck. They both looked at the sunken loaves and scolded. Then Ma'am came down from upstairs. She looked at the bread and then at Shoe Fly. What happened? she asked. Shoe Fly pointed to Betty. She did it. She didn't know. Ma'am frowned and said nothing. She put the Shoe Fly pies in the oven and told the two girls to go outside and play. Betty began to cry. Shoefly put an arm around her. She felt sorry for her. Poor Betty didn't know any better. They went outside and saw the twins playing. They were baking cake. They said, I found six eggs in the hen house, said Pumpkin. We mixed them with mud. It makes very good cake, said Puddin. We put corn on the top just for fancy, said Pumpkin. So it's mud corn cake, said Puddin. Shoefly and Betty had to laugh. There was the crow sitting on the fence. Let's play with Jackie, said Shoefly. She called and the bird came and perched on her finger. She fed it some corn. The crow made talking noises. Say hello, said Shoefly. The crow cocked his head and looked at Shoefly. Hello, he called. Hello, Jackie, said Shoe Fly. Hello, Jackie, answered the crow. Betty laughed nervously. I never knew a crow could talk. She said she wasn't sure she liked the crow at all. Every morning he sits by my window and calls me, said Shoe Fly. He tells me when it's time to get up. He won't stop until I come out and feed him. The crow went flying up in the air. It came down and landed on the clothesline. It began to peck at the clothes pens. Shoe fly chased it. Go away, Jackie. Let ma'am's clothes pens alone. What's he doing? asked Betty. He likes to peck the clothes pens off, said Shoe fly, and hide them. He even takes our hankies and hides them. The crow flapped down again. He landed on Betty's head in the middle of her curls. She screamed and fought it off. She was terrified. Ah, cried Shoe Fly, laughing. You look so strubbly. She chased the bird away. He flew up into the treetops. 
Then Rags and Hayfork came running. Want a ride? Want a ride? They called. Old Bug is waiting. Take off your shoes and socks, said Shoe Fly. It's lots more fun. Betty did as she was told. The Amish children hated shoes and seldom wore them at home, often going barefoot, even in cold weather. Shoe Fly and Betty ran up the bank slope to the open barn door. The barn was built on the slope of a bank. That <clears throat> is why it was called a bank barn. There stood an old broken down buggy without a top. It had no shafts, no seat, and only a board to sit on, but its wheels were still in running order. Rags had tied a rope to the front axle to guide it. The children climbed on. and were ready to go. The twins and the dog Pretzel came too. It made a big load. Rags gave a push and down the hill they went, laughing and screaming down the steep hill and into the grassy field where old Bug stopped. Pretzel barked loudly. They all piled out and pulled old Bug up the hill again. Down they went over and over. It was fun. Oh, come on, said Shoe Fly, getting tired. Let's go over to Gross Mama's. Gross Mama and Aunt Susanna had been cleaning house. One of the upstairs windows was open. Jackie the Crow had spotted the girls and now started swooping down over their heads. Oh, I'm scared. Make him stop. Betty covered her head with her arms. He'll get in my hair again. He'll scratch my eyes out. He likes you, said Shoe Fly. He won't hurt you. Don't be afraid. But I don't like him, wailed Betty. Make him go away. Shoe Fly took a broom from Gross Mama's porch and waved it at the crow. He lighted on the end of the broom and made the girls laugh. Then she banged the broom on the porch post and he flew off, cawing noisily. He's mad, said Shoe Fly. He's scolding us. Up and round in the air flew the crow cawing and squawking. Yes, well, let us alone once, said Shoe Fly. The crow circled around high overhead, and then with a swoop, sailed in at the open upstairs window of Gross Mama's house. Shoe Fly gasped. How terrible now it was the window of the good room, the room where all the treasures were kept. I must run and tell Gross Mama. I must tell Aunt Susanna I must shoo him out of there. Shoofly ran into the house with frightened Betty at her heels. No one was there. Where had people gone? Were they out in the garden somewhere? Shoofly opened the stair door and ran up the steps. The door to the good room was always kept closed and the shades pulled down. But now they were up and the window open to air the room out. <clears throat> There was the crow in the middle of the room. Caw, caw, he said, cocking his eye at Shoe Fly. Ah, what a wicked bird you are, cried Shoe Fly. See what you've done. Shoe out of here, shoe on out, and stay out where. You belong. She shooed and chased. The crow flapped and flopped and knocked things over. At last he found the open window and flew out, but not till after he had done a great deal of damage. The good room was the place where treasures were kept. There were two handsome bureaus and two cedar chests belonging to Dat's two unmarried sisters, Aunt Susanna and Aunt Leah. Aunt Leah was away working on a farm. The chests and bureaus were full of handmade quilts and sheets, pillowcases and towels. On the top stood beautiful dishes and glassware, vases, cups, and saucers, pitchers, water sets, serving dishes. All these things were gifts the ants had kept since they were little girls. It was their pay for staying with their parents and taking care of them. It was their dowry for their marriage. Aunt Susanna's choicest treasure was a bunch of artificial fruit, grapes, peaches, lemons, and bananas that had been given her when she was ten. They were beautiful because 
They looked so real. Shoofly stared at them in dismay. The crow had ruined them. He had pecked holes in the peaches, scattered the grapes, and broken open the bananas. Worse of all, in his mad flight about the room, he had left a trail of broken glass and china behind him. Shu Fly felt like crying. Ay, what will Cross Mama say? What will Aunt Susanna say? Now they will want to get rid of him, that's for sure. Betty put her arm around her. But it wasn't your fault. The crow got in, she said. Somebody left the window open. But Shoe Fly's heart sank. It's my crow, she said sadly. Nobody likes him but me. It was an anticlimax. Shoe Fly had wanted to tell Betty about the good room and how scared it was. The room was so elegant it always sent shivers up and down Shoe Fly's spine. All the furniture used to belong to dead people. None of the treasures were ever touched. They were keepsakes to be kept. Every little hanky, every dish, every vase had the name of its donor marked on it in remembrance. In the good room, beauty and sentiment, denied in Amish living, were enshrined and held captive. Shoofly wanted to tell Betty Ferguson this. It was something important in her life, something that Betty Ferguson had never seen or heard of, something that English people did not know about. But now it was spoiled. The good room had been invaded and desecrated. And by that mean old crow, Jackie, was he really as bad and mean as everybody said? Shoofly shrugged her shoulders. I like him anyhow, she thought. I won't let him go. He's mine. He's the only thing I've got that nobody else wants. Aloud, she said, let's go quick before Ross Mama gets back. They ran back home and there in the house yard. Another calamity met their eyes. Most of Mam's nice clean washing. Was lying on the ground. More of Jackie's mischief. The crow had taken out all the clothespins and hid them somewhere. Jonas was right to call him a thief. Mam would be furious. The twins came screaming. Who took our play dishes? Who took our play dishes? But Shoofly did not linger. Out in the barnyard, she suddenly had an idea. Let's go horseback riding, she said. Oh, I'd be afraid to, said Betty. But you said you liked horses, said Shoofly. Only in books, said Betty. I just love horse books. We've got five horses and two mules, said Shoofly. I can hitch up a horse, feed it, harness it, and ride horseback. Betty looked at her in astonishment. Come, I'll show you a real horse. Shoofly went in the stable and brought out old lady. Lady was nearly twenty years old, no longer able to work, but the children loved her. Come, let's go for a ride, cried Shoofly. She led <clears throat> lady to the fence and climbed upon her back. Pumpkin and Pudding came to and climbed on behind. Betty climbed on the fence and they all pulled her up. She was up there but sitting backwards and they could not turn her around. The horse was so high it was scary to Betty. The horse was so wide it was like being on a roof. Then the whole thing began to move and bounce up and down. Betty hung on tight. She tried not to scream but wailing words burst from her mouth. I want off, take me off, cried Betty. Slowly at first, then round and round, the barnyard, the old horse, went. It was a good thing Betty was wedged in tightly. She could not possibly fall. Then, well, it wasn't so bad after all. Just when she was beginning to enjoy it, a green car drove into the barnyard. It was Miss Ferguson come to take Betty home. Why does she have to come? asked Shoofly. Can't you ever walk? After all, Betty lived only ten minutes away. Let me down, let me down, screamed Betty. That's Mommy. They all slid off and ran to the car. Miss Ferguson stared in dismay. She hardly knew her own daughter. Betty's clothes were soiled and dirty. Her hair was wild and her face was black. Her feet were bare and dirty too. Where are your shoes and socks, Betty? Her mother demanded.
Shoe Fly decided to speak up for her. She took them off. She said, We hate shoes. I see you do, said Miss Ferguson, looking at all the bare, dirty feet. We can run faster without shoes, said Shoe Fly. Betty, where are your shoes and socks? asked Miss Ferguson. It took a long time to find them. Then Betty got in the car with her mother. Goodbye, Betty, cried Shoe Fly and the twins. Come again soon. I <clears throat> ever had so much fun in my whole life, Betty called back as the car went out the lane. That evening, Gross Mama came over and reported the damage in the good room. She said Aunt Susanna wept over the ruined artificial fruit. Shoe Fly told her she had found the crow inside and had shooed it out. Everybody said the crow was bad, and Ma'am said she was tired of finding her washing on the ground every week and the small pieces gone. Dat said it was time to get rid of the crow. Jonas said, don't worry, he'll fly away one of these days and we'll never see him again. They all said such bad things about the crow <clears throat> that Shoefly's heart sank. What would happen to her pet? The next day, Ma'am took Shoe Fly to the pie stand after school and said she would come for her later. It was her first time at the pie stand alone. She felt very sad after Ma'am drove home and left her. She tried to remember her instructions, then sat down and watched the cars whiz by. Nobody stopped. Shoe Fly was weaving pot holders. Beck had showed her how. She hated to weave, and the pot holders always ended up crooked. But Ma'am said she could sell them and keep half the money, so she set to work. There was nobody to talk to. After a long time, a car stopped. The people asked questions. They asked her name and how old she was. They bought homemade bread. Another car stopped. A woman bought bread and two pot holders. Shoefly took the money and put it in her purse. It hung from its long strap over her shoulder. She opened and shut it carefully. The cars went zipping by. When they did not stop, Shoefly wished they would. When they did, she wished they wouldn't. It frightened her. It was hard to talk to strangers. Everybody wanted bread, and it was soon sold out. Everybody wanted potholders and she couldn't make them fast enough. Nobody wanted pie today. The flies came and buzzed around. Would ma'am never come? And what would she say when she saw the pies were not sold? Now it was lonelier than ever. It was getting dark, too. The cars had turned their lights on. The headlights shone in her eyes and blinded her. When was ma'am coming? Why did ma'am keep her waiting so long? She wanted to go home. She wanted to stay at home and never go away again. Then, all at once, two big headlights like the eyes of a monster came right toward her. Another car was going the other way, so the monster turned aside to avoid hitting it. A screech of the brakes, a loud crash. It came to a quick stop, just in time. Shoefly saw it coming, jumped back, terrified, and started to run. Anywhere, anywhere, to get away from the monster. Crying and sobbing, she stumbled across the field. Then a man's voice spoke, and a man's hand caught her by the arm. Don't run away, the man said. It's all over. I didn't mean to frighten you. There's no harm done. My brakes are good. Come on back now, shoefly girl. I won't hurt you. She knew him at once. It was the mystery man from <clears throat> Massachusetts who liked shoefly pie so much. He was the one who had given her that terrible nickname. Now he had almost run over her if she had not run. Then she looked. The pie stand stood where it always stood. It was not hurt at all. Nothing was disturbed. The big black monster's headlights threw a bright light on everything, on all the pies and cakes that nobody wanted. Well, Shoefly Girl, that was a close shave, said the man calmly. That drive, that crazy driver was heading straight for me, and I had to get out of the way. I'm sorry I frightened you. He pointed to the pies. How's business today? Good? 
About time for you to go home, isn't it? Nobody here with you today. How are the pies? Good? Shoofly could not answer any of his questions. She was still white and shaken. Why didn't ma'am come and take her and the pies and cakes home? I'll take everything, the man said, but Shoofly did not hear. He put some bills in her hand and started to put the pies in a box in his car. Then Shoofly heard the sound of a horse's hoofs, and the next minute ma'am got out of her buggy. Shoofly ran to her mother's arms and burst into tears. He tried to run over me, she cried. The man talked to ma'am, explaining everything. He ended up saying, I bought her out. Och, but Miss Fisher began, you must have a big family to eat all those pies and cakes. The man turned toward her. His face had a stricken look. Yes, big family, he said. He started up his car and drove away. Don't make me go again. Don't make me go again, begged Shoofly all the way home. The world was full of peril and risk, temptation and evil. All her life, Shoofly had been warned of the dangers of worldliness. From the safe and quiet world of her home, she had taken her first step outside, and she did not like what she saw there. She crept home, hurt and bewildered. Then another blow came, worse than the first. It came close, not striking her directly, but her brother Jonas, and that was almost the same as herself, for he was the favorite of all her brothers and sisters, the only one who understood her. Dat and Jonas and Rags had gone over to Uncle Chris's to help fill the silo with green corn. The farm seemed empty and lifeless without them. In the late afternoon, Shoofly went out to gather the eggs. Some of the hens liked to lay in the barn, so she went in to look for eggs. Shoofly could not climb up on the rafters now and jump down in the soft hay any more. <clears throat> All the upper part was filled with drying tobacco. She walked around slowly. Becky Green Eyes and her kittens came up mewing, so she got some milk and fed them. Now and then she found an egg and put it in her basket. The whole place was quiet. Off in the field she could hear the crows cawing and know that Jackie must be with them. Suddenly a strange sound met her ears. She stood still and listened. Was she dreaming? Was it music? Where was it coming from? It was very soft, and sometimes it nearly died away. Then it came on louder and sweeter again. Was it, could it be, a radio? Miss Weber had one at school, the only one Shoofly had ever heard. <clears throat> Amish families did not have them. The bishop told them they were not necessary. The music was light and lively. It made Shoofly feel happy, almost like dancing on her toes. Where was it coming from? It must be secret music hidden away somewhere. Forgetting about the eggs, Shoofly searched. She knew all the dark corners and out-of-the-way hiding places. She crept about quietly in the harness room and out. In the stable and out in the egg room, the granary, granary and then in the old carriage shed. It was like a game, playing now hot, now cold. She felt herself getting warmer and warmer as she came up to the old broken buggy. It was Old Bug, the one the children played with. A big canvas had been thrown over the half-broken frame to make a shelter. She crept around to the back and looked in. There sat Jonas, big 15-year-old Jonas, Huddled in a heap on the seat of the buggy was a radio set on the floor. Ah, oh, cried Shoofly, so it's you. I found you once. Shh, shh, said Jonas, fingers to his lips. Why do you have to come here and spoil everything? I, I heard music, and began Shoofly. Well, now clear out, get going, go on away, and don't come around here again. But I thought you went to Uncle Chris's to help fill the silo said Shoofly. I did, and I worked, and I came away, said Jonas. They've got all the help they need without me. Shoofly pointed to the forbidden radio. Where did you get it? She asked in a whisper. 
I borrowed it, said Jonas, and don't you go tell on me. Shoefly shook her head. She and Jonas were friends. They liked each other. She could count on Jonas more than any of her other brothers or sisters. She could not be disloyal. Jonas was a big tease, but most of the time he was good to her. She climbed up in the buggy and sat down. What will Dat say if he finds out, she asked. He won't say much. He'll just smash it. What will the bishop say, she whispered. I won't tell him, said Jonas. But if he finds out, said Shoefly, he won't unless some little squirt squeals on me, said Jonas. On that one at school last year, I heard all about space and rockets and missiles. He turned the knob, and the tune changed to a loud, noisy one. He turned it lower. That's jazz, he said with a grin. Och, I don't like it, said Shoofly frightened. Turn it off. It hurts my ears terrible. It's all the rage, said Jonas. Bill Ferguson tells me. Shoofly knew that Betty had an older brother named Bill. Did you borrow it from Bill, she asked. Jonas closed his lips tight. I'm not telling, he said. Then he looked at his sister and blurted out, Sometimes I wish I wasn't Amish at all. I like TV and radios and cars. Och, Jonas, gasped Shoofly, don't say that. It's true, said Jonas, I can't help it. Where have you seen TV? asked Shoofly. At a tavern in town, said Jonas. Bill took me. Bill wants me to go away with him, to Canada maybe. He has some rich relatives living there. We could do as we please. There are no bishops up there. Och, Jonas, cried Shoefly in distress. Don't say that. Jonas had not meant to tell her at all, but she was his trusting friend, and he had to tell somebody. He felt better after he had blurted it out. Then, even in the dim light of the shed, he saw the shocked look on his sister's face, and it frightened him. Oh, shucks, he said, forget it. I'm not going. Don't get so scared. It's just that sometimes I wish I could. He turned the radio off now. Don't tell anybody where I keep it, said Jonas. I won't, said Shoefly. Then she had an idea. If, if you like music, she began, why don't you get a mouth organ instead? The bishop says harmonicas are okay. Ha, huh, snorted Jonas, kid stuff. Who wants one of them? But you can play pretty tunes on it, said Shoefly. Somehow she wanted to help her brother, but how? Take your eggs and go in the house, said Jonas. I'm going back to Uncle Chris's. This is our secret now. Will you promise me you won't tell? Shoefly nodded her serious face. There was no one around as she slowly made her way to the back door but her heart was heavy with the burden that Jonas had placed there. Chapter 4. A Godly Child Oh, we're going to Gross Dottie Yotters. Shoefly danced around on her tippy toes. What fun that would be to take Cousin Eli's new pony cart over. Maybe Eli would give her a ride. Shoefly was glad when she heard that church would be held next Sunday at Uncle Dave's. The Amish people had no church buildings. They took turns holding church meetings. In different homes, it was a big event to have church held at your house. Of course, it meant work, too. There was always something to take the joy out of life. But no need to worry about that now. On Saturday, Ma'am and Jonas and Reuben and Shoefly climbed into the buggy. The others stayed at home. That hitched Eli's pony cart on behind the buggy and told Jonas to keep his eye on it. Jonas and Shoefly rode in the back with the curtain rolled up. They had not gone far when they saw a black shadow fly overhead. Back and forth over the buggy it went, back and forth over Skipper's head, darting down and then up. Och, it's Jackie, cried Shoefly. I let him out of his pen and forgot to put him back. He likes to stay out and fly around. He likes to fly away, said Jonas. 
Some day he'll be gone. Oh no, said Shoe Fly, he's tame, he won't leave me. Did you feed him? asked Jonas. No, I forgot. Crows can't ever get enough to eat, said Jonas. They're worse than hogs. The more you feed them, the more they want. Jackie's going right along with us, cried Shoe Fly. Hi, Jackie, come here. Come sit on my finger, and I'll give you a, tie, a ride. Don't call him, said Jonas. Better let him go home. If he comes along, he'll get lost, and you'll never see him again. They turned into the highway, and the crow disappeared. I think Jackie got tired and went home, said Shoe Fly. Shoe Fly's mother was a yachter and one of seven sisters. Gross Mama and Gross Daddy Yotter lived at their son Dave's near Bird in Hand. Gross Mama Yotter was an invalid and had a hired girl to take care of her. The grandparents lived in the Gross Daddy house. Uncle Dave and Aunt Sadie lived in the other half of the double house. They had five children, Eli the oldest, then three little girls, and baby Johnny. Today, all the seven aunts, Uncle Dave's sisters, were there to help get Aunt Sadie's house ready for church. There was no time for fooling. Everybody was put to work. Aunt Martha, the oldest, was the boss. She could not tolerate laziness. She gave orders right and left. Shoofly put her head in at the back door. Everything was in a hubbub. Rugs were rolled up and chairs pushed into corners. Two ants stood on chairs washing windows. Two more cleaned stoves and polished them. All the folding doors between downstairs rooms had been removed, others taken off their hinges. Susanna cried Aunt Martha, Take these babies out from underfoot. Keep them in the yard. Shoofly hated babysitting, but she took the children out. No chance for a ride in the pony cart today. She could see that. Even Eli hadn't had a chance to look at it. He was busy like everybody else. He and Jonas and Reuben and other boy cousins were hard at work. They were whitewashing all the fences. Then the stables had to be cleaned and swept. Everything had to be spick and span for church tomorrow. Out the back door came Aunt Martha. Shoofly hated to see her come. She didn't she have enough to do inside. Susanna, get busy and rake up all the leaves, she ordered. If it was fall and leaves were coming down fast, the baby cousins were too little to help. All they could do was squall. Beck and Bib had been left at home to do Saturday cleaning there. Shoofly had to keep an eye on the babies and do the raking herself. It was no fun at all. She had just finished when Aunt Martha came out again. She was not satisfied. Look what a mess, she said. Look at the leaves you've left. Pick up every single one in your fingers, every single one. Shoofly's mouth fell open, but the wind, she began. It keeps blowing them down from the trees. The wind did not bother Aunt Martha. Every single leaf, she said, shaking her finger at Shoofly. Do you want me to stand every single blade of grass up straight too? asked Shoofly, but she said it under her breath so Aunt Martha would not hear. Nobody ever talked back to Aunt Martha, and so it went on, work, 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 no fun at all. No pony cart ride, not even a chance to ask Eli for a ride, no chance to see Gross Dotty Yottery either. Where was he? Had he gone off for the day to get away from all the women, or was he hiding somewhere? Shoofly dropped her rake and ran over to his toy shop to see. Yes, Gross Dottie had a toy shop. He said he was retired now, too old to do farming. Let son Dave do the work. He would take life easy, but not just loaf, no, no.
he had to have something to do, and he liked to hammer and saw. <clears throat> so he had cleaned out the old chicken house across the lane and made it into a toy shop. It was a fascinating place, and Shoofly liked to go there. Gross Dottie made toys to sell to tourists. He jigsawed out toy horses and lions and pigs and cows and painted them. He made toy barns and barnyards. He made not only toys but big bird houses. Gross Dottie loved purple martins. It was he who had put up the four martin houses on high post in the fisher's barnyard. He had four more in his own barnyard. Grostati knew all about Martins. He told stories about the one with the white breast that came back year after year. Today, the door to the toy shop was locked. Shoe Fly could not get in. She peeped through the window. No one was there. Where was Grostati anyhow? Back in the barnyard, she saw the men coming in wagons, bringing the long benches for the people to sit on at church tomorrow. They took them into the house. Then it was time to go home. It had been no fun at all. But the next day, Sunday, promised better. Shoofly awoke, excited and happy. Sunday meant getting up at 5.30 and doing chores before daylight. It meant eating a hurried breakfast, then helping the little ones get ready. The boys had to be washed and combed and dressed, shoes put on and tied. The twins had to be washed, hair combed and braided, capes and white aprons penned, and caps put on and tied. Pens got lost and could not be found. It took so many pens. Each apron took five, each cape five more. Where did the pens go to anyway? But at last, everybody was off, two buggies full. Just as they were starting, Shoe Fly saw Jackie flying overhead. She heard him cawing noisily. Maybe he wants to go to church, she thought. Then she put the thought away, knowing how wicked it was. The country road was full of buggies, all going in the same direction. Shoefly and the twins sat in the back of Gross Mama Fisher's buggy. The rear curtain was down, and they could not see a thing. It was like being cooped up in prison, a long, long, never-ending drive. At last, old Sonny Boy stopped, backed around, and they all got out at Gross Daddy Yotter's. A large flock of birds flew overhead, but no one noticed. Soon the excitement began. Uncle Dave's place looked as neat as a pen, not a blade of grass out of place. A procession of Amish buggies was coming down the lane. Others were already there. People were coming from all directions. Everybody would see how clean and neat Uncle Dave's place was. Not a single leaf on the lawn. The wind must have stopped blowing. Shoefly smiled in smug satisfaction. The house was half full already, the long benches all in place. All the bearded men left their big black felt hats on the porch and sat together on one side. All the white-capped women and girls on the other side. The two big rooms opened up together, made it seem as big as a real church. The stove and sideboard, which could not be moved, had been discreetly covered with dark cloth pinned tightly down. Nothing worldly must intrude. The dark sh green shades were pulled halfway down in a neat line. Aunt Sadie's African violets sat in a row on high shelves across the windows, blooming gaily, unafraid. The peaked clock on the high shelf above the fancy pincushions was not afraid to tick and a even strike when necessary, but all else was very quiet. Sunday was a solemn occasion. Sunday meant seeing a lot of people. There were a hundred and sixty in the district, counting the children, and they were all there except the sick. Church meant shaking hands with everybody. Shoefly felt her hand go limp and thought it would drop off. She was glad to sit down at last. Just in time, here came the long line of boys, Eli, Jonas, and Reuben, and too many others to count. They had had to take care of all the horses, unhitch them from their buggies, 
and put them in the barn. Now the boys marched in single file, removed their hats, and took their places behind the men. Soon in came the bishop, the deacon, and the three ministers. They sat down in big rocking chairs reserved for them. They had backs to the rest to rest on. Singing a soft whining chant began and kept on. Shoofly sat with Ma'am, who had Aunt Sadie's baby on her lap, and the twins on the women's side. The twins looked as nice as Shoofly did, with white Sunday aprons and white caps on. Only on Sunday did they wear white. What's more, their dresses were pink, a lovely pink. This was quite a change from school dresses, which were always in dark colors. It made Sunday a very special day. The little boys, Henry or Hayfork and Sammy, sat with Dat across the room. All the young fathers took care of toddlers, leaving the babies to the young mothers. The service began early at 8.30 and moved slowly. Inevitably along, him singing came at intervals between preaching, praying, and testimony. The first sermon was short, the second one long. Shoofly listened. Words, German words, like Ewicket and Himmel, washed over her as the men's voices rose and fell. Through it all ran a comforting, home-like din babies crying, children fussing and feeding, being taken in and out, things dropping and being picked up, children walking out and coming back right under the bishop's nose and gesturing arms. The hands on the clock on the mantel seemed to stand still if watched, but sometimes the clock growled and struck the hour, nine, ten, then eleven. Most of the younger children were barefoot. Bare feet did not mean poverty nor carelessness, but comfort. Shoofly's shoes were left in the buggy. Now, with her bare, f bare toes, she opened Ma'am's little covered basket sitting on the floor it held all sorts of surprises, pretty hankies to make mice or cradle and baby out of, cookies to nibble on, <clears throat> pretzels to chew, a spool rattle for Aunt Sadie's baby, and a little storybook. Shoofly got it out and read it in a whisper to Pumpkin and Puddin. Everything was going fine when suddenly a loud noise was heard. It came from outside, a tremendous squawking close at hand. Birds were flying close over the barnyard, coming in closer up to the tree by the house. Were they martins? No, the martins had gone south long ago. Starlings, maybe. A man across the room pulled the shade up behind him and looked out. Shoofly stretched her neck to see. The bishop went on shouting as if trying to drown out the clamor of the birds. Baby Johnny began to wail. Ma'am whispered to Shoofly, telling her to take him out to the kitchen and get him a drink of water. Shoofly got up, baby in arms, and began stumbling over women's feet. She went out to the porch. The yard was full of birds. See the birds, Johnny, she whispered, pointing. Johnny laughed. They were crows, black crows. Shoofly's heart skipped a beat. Was Jackie there among them? Of course not. Jackie was safe back at home. They were making a terrible noise, as if it was not Sunday at all. The bishop did not like noise on Sunday, but the birds did not care. They cawed and cawed. They flew out, the, out and back. They acted as if they were holding a meeting of their own. Other Amish children sneaked out to the porch and watched, smiling. One big crow seemed to be the master voice. He gave the others orders. Was he preaching to them? Shoofly wondered. He chased them away, one by one. He was left all alone in the tree. Did he quiet down then? No, he cawed louder than ever. Was he trying to outcaw the bishop? The bishop did not like it. He stopped his sermon, spoke to a man beside him, and the man went out. The man waved his arms and yelled, but the crow would not go away. It kept on making raucous noises. The man got a stick and waved it, but the crow would not go away. 
When the service was over, everybody got up and stretched. The women brought cold food to the long tables. They put sliced bread, pickles, Lebanon bologna, cheese, and square honks and jams on the table. The older men sat down to eat in the front room, the older women in the kitchen, then the younger men and the younger women, and at last the children. Shoofly was hungry. Her arm reached out to get what she could, bread, cheese, bologna, and pickles. Then she ran out to play. The crows were gone now. All the children enjoyed being turned loose again. They piled benches on top of each other to make slides. The little girls slid down on their tummies, right on their pretty white Sunday aprons. Nobody scolded them. The small boys made a slide of their own. They slid down all together, landing in a laughing heap at the bottom. Nobody scolded them either. The older men sat quietly under the large shade tree and talked. The bishop was in the center. Everybody listened to what he had to say. Then out of the blue sky came a crow. It was the same bad black crow that had disturbed the service. It flew down close over the men's heads. It interrupted their conversation. The bishop took off his hat and waved it. He tried to shoo the crow away, but it would not go. The other men shooed it. Still, it would not go. It seemed to be very tame. It seemed to like the bishop. Shoofly ran closer to see. Was it? Could it be Jackie? Could Jackie have followed the buggy all the way over to Gross Dottie's house? The next minute, the crow was on her head. Och now, it was Jackie, and she forgot to feed him this morning. Had he come so far to get some dinner? Oh dear, oh dear. The bishop was coming toward her. What would he do? What could she do? Trembling, she did not know which way to turn. Go away, Jackie. The bird now sat on her outstretched hand. Shoo, shoo, go, go home now. Stop bothering us. It's Sunday. Don't you know that, Jackie? The bishop came closer. All the children stopped their play and stood silent. The crow flew up in the air. The bishop patted Shoofly on the head. What a pleasure to see such a godly child, he said. I saw you entertaining the little ones, good girl. Och, cried Shoofly, looking up at him in surprise. I thought you were going to scold my crow. No, said the bishop. God made the birds, even ugly, noisy birds like the crows. Does this crow belong to you? Shoofly nodded. The crow had settled on her shoulder now. She could not speak. What a fine pet, said the bishop. Then he went away. That was all. After the bishop and the deacon and the church members went away, only the family was left. They were not in a hurry to go home. They sat around and visited. Cross Dottie Yotter came up to the little girls and said, Come, I have something to show you. Shoofly and the twins followed him. Cross Dottie was a great one for secrets and surprises. He led them to the toy shop. The toy shop was always locked on Sundays, but he took the key from his pocket and unlocked the door. I have a surprise for you, he said. He opened the door, and there on a low table right inside stood a dollhouse, a big, beautiful two-story dollhouse, with roof and windows and two chimneys and everything. The girls looked with big eyes in silence. And you say, noddings. Gross Dottie laughed until his white beard shook. You got noddings to say. Did you make it? asked Pumpkin. Who is it for? asked Puddin. So that's what you want to know, laughed Gross Dottie. I fool you this time, it's not for you. A man came, a tourist, he I he say he is from Massachusetts. He want I should make it for. He got little girls, asked Pumpkin. Ja, two little girls, he tell me, said Gross Dottie. It's nice, said Puddin. I like it, said Pumpkin. Even the twins were learning self-denial. Shoofly had never played much with dolls. There were always babies to be tended. 
she looked the dollhouse over carefully. One side was open, so she could see into all the rooms above and below. Two stairways had been put in, but something was wrong. At the tops of the steps, there were no holes in the floor, so the stairs were useless. Susie, what are you thinking? asked Grostati, putting his arm around her shoulder. The stairs, they go nowhere, said Shoofly. Grostati roared with laughter. Then she asked, did you say the man was from Massachusetts? Ja, said Grostati. So he said, Shoofly thought of the mystery man at the pie stand. It couldn't be the same person. There were many tourists from Massachusetts. They went out, and Grostati locked the door again. Now we go to see Gross Mama, he said, leading the way into the big stone house. The children followed and came to the bedroom. Gross Mama Yotter was sitting in an easy chair. She was pale and thin. She looked at them and smiled, but she could not talk. Awestruck, the children said a few words and went out. Then Eli came bustling up from the barn, looking very important. Who wants a ride in my new pony cart, he asked. I do, I do, cried the twins and shoe fly. Round the corner of the barn came Eli's pony hitched up to the new pony cart. He took the littlest cousins for a ride first, drove down the lane and back. Then he took the older ones. Eli was very grand and very generous, gener uh, generous showing off his new pony cart. Eli kept on urging his pony, Buster, to go faster and faster. Eli thought it was fun to show off, even if it was Sunday. Shoofly had to wait a long time for her turn. Then she got in with Reuben and Henry. Henry. Buster started out the lane and came back as usual, but he did not stop. He kept on going faster. Back in the barnyard, he darted from the path, dashed across the vegetable garden and flower beds, bumped into the newly whitewashed fence, then started around the spring house, flying around corners on two wheels. Eli thought it was a big joke and kept slapping the reins. Oh, what a ride! Eli began shouting and the children began laughing. It was so funny. The pony had never done anything like this before. Then they were crying out with fright as they hung on for dear life. Was the pony running away? Buster was a quiet old pony. He had never galloped in his life. Now the new pony cart went bouncing across the ruts and the tobacco field, jolting up and down behind a wild-eyed galloping pony. Uncle Dave and Dat came tearing behind. The women and children at the house began screaming. First Sammy went tumbling off, then Henry, but Shoofly hung on. Then she saw what had happened. She saw the black wings flapping over her head. She heard the loud cause of the mean old crow. Was Jackie bent on Sunday mischief? Was Jackie as mean as everyone said he was? Was she the only one who liked having a crow for a pet? Down in front of the pony's eyes, the crow darted, then up over its head, landing between its ears, all the time cawing and scaring the poor pony half to death. No wonder old Buster ran away. Then at last the cart was stopped, but not before the hind hoofs of the pony had struck Cousin Eli in the head. The men got there, stopped in the crazed pony, and picked Eli up off the ground, a stream of blood running from his forehead. They left the cart where it was. One of the men unfastened the harness and took Buster back to the barn. Shoofly still held on to the sides of the pony cart. Her knuckles were white. She was holding so tight. She sat there for a while after the others left. She saw Henry and Sammy get up and run back, none the worse for their tumbles. But Eli was killed, she was sure of that, and her conscience smote her. She had said and thought so many bad things about Eli, and now he was dead. She felt something on her shoulder. She looked. There was Jackie, the mean old crow who had caused all the trouble. He cocked his eye at her and said, Caw, caw, caw. 
It was a sad home going after a happy day. Uncle Dave had to get a non-Amish neighbor with a car to take Eli to the hospital. Eli was still unconscious. Nobody knew how badly he was hurt. Cross Mama Fisher and Aunt Susanna talked about it all the way home. Shoofly cried till she thought her heart would break.